Suzanne Legrand, and this is Disobedient Femmes. Today, my guest is writer, speaker, and activist Jacqueline Friedman. She is the co-author with Jessica Valenti of Believe Me, How Trusting Women Can Change the World. Welcome. Thanks for having me. You said something in your book, which I think is a great place to start, an unfortunate place to start as well. You say, women's pain is expected, part of the wallpaper of life. Can you talk a little bit about why that is and how that figures into your book, which is about believing women and believing women's pain, among other things? I mean, the why, the answer to why is kind of boring. I mean, it's patriarchy, right? It's it's literally the power structure that is built in part on women's pain. Um, You know, we had to, if we have to pay attention to women's pain and treat it as important, a lot of things in the culture are going to have to change. And that's actually what the book is about, about how the world would be truly transformed if we just treated women. And when we say believe me about women, we don't just mean literally do I think what you're saying is true, although that's part of it. But we we need to treat women both as credible and important, right? So if you think about what happened with Christine Blasey Ford, most people, I think even Republicans, believed her on some level, they found her credible, but she just wasn't treated by the people in power as important enough for it to matter. Um, so if we just treated women the same way we already treat men, right, as though we are, until proven otherwise, credible and important, we'd have to change a lot of the structures that our lives are built around, I like, think, for the better. Like what? What would, what would change? I mean, it's a, it's a really great question to think about this, right? If we believe women, if we took them to be credible, and if we took their experiences to be important, what would our society look like? What do you think would change? Oh my gosh, everything would change. And and I should say, the book is full of essays written by a wide variety of brilliant contributors, literally about that question, what would change? So the structure of the internet would change because we'd be funding female technologists who would be building different projects. And the given the, the technology we already have would have already taken seriously the fact that it was being used to harass and target women, and those loopholes would have been closed and made much harder to target the elections, for mm-hmm. example, mm-hmm. right? Trump would not be president mm-hmm. if we believed women. That's clear. There are over 12 credible allegations against him, uh, let alone that there was a credible woman running against him. Um, so everything, the, the, our, the very assumptions we make about how psychology work would have to change. There's a wonderful essay in the book by, Maura Do- bleh, by Moira Donakin. I'm going to try that again so I don't sound like I'm hitting her name that hard. <laughs> There's a wonderful essay in the book by the writer Moira Donegan, which totally blew my mind. And I studied psychology in college about how Freud, when he first started studying women and their symptoms of what we would now call PTSD, he correctly diagnosed them. He said in an early book, he said, these women are exhibiting these symptoms because they've been abused and violated by the men in their lives. And it was such a scandal in the circles that he ran in among his male colleagues and the people who he needed approval from to have a career that he took it back. He buried that thing that he knew. And he said, oh, women are hysterical. They have penis envy. They all wish to be dominated and raped secretly. All of these things that we have commonly as assumptions about female psychology that come from Freud really were invented by him to cover up for something that he already knew, which is that women were believable. Wow, that's something. Yeah. So he caved to pressure to reinforce patriarchal notions that it's women's biology that's the problem. Yeah, absolutely. He chose his career, his own access to power, 
over believing women. And that's often what happens, right? So that's why we say we have to treat women as both credible and important, because you can find plenty of examples where people are willing to believe women unless it costs them something, right? <laughs> Unless we have to do something about it that might actually make us uncomfortable or make, you know, require some kind of sacrifice, then we we just immediately sort of throw women under the bus. So let's take this from a, a different tact. You say that our national failure to take women seriously is a public health crisis. Can you talk about how and why that's true? Yeah, so that's from my essay. And I open it talking about mass shootings, and we'll take that as an example, although there are many examples. Uh, almost every time when you hear about a mass shooting, the shooter, who's always a man, has abused women in his life previously. He has a record of violence or assault against his girlfriend or a restraining order was taken up by his mother or a teacher. And if we had taken that abuse seriously he would not be able to access a gun, right? If we thought men who are a danger to women, we have to take that seriously. We have to actually do something about that, not treat it as the wallpaper of life. Then he wouldn't be able to access a gun and that mass shooting wouldn't have happened. If you think about black women's maternal mortality rates, which are, I mean, the overall maternal mortality rate in the United States is sky high compared to all other developed nations. And the black women's maternal mortality rate is something like five times higher than white women. So it's mostly being born by black women. And it's because medicine as an institution doesn't believe black women about their own experiences. I mean, you saw this a couple of years ago when Serena Williams had her baby and really was fighting for her life and knew what was wrong with her. She had a medical condition that she knew all about and was trying to advocate to the people caring for her. And they decided they knew better than her. And she almost died. And she's one of the most powerful and black women in our culture, right? Uh, due to her celebrity, right? And her wealth. But it, so it's not just about being poor, right? It's about being a black woman and mistrusted. So these are longstanding systems in place, right? Sexism, racism have unfortunately a really long history. So in the book, how is it that you are proposing that we change these structures or what do we change in order to turn this around? Because there's a lot of reasons why patriarchy doesn't want us to believe in women or consider them credible. Yeah, absolutely. So I wouldn't say that the book is full of solutions as much as it is full of visions. And in fact, we struggled with this a little. I remember talking to a couple of our contributors who said, I don't know how to write the vision part of my essay because we really set it up. The charge to each writer was, you know, in the area that you're writing about, you can describe how things are now, but we it needs to contain an idea of how things would be different if we believed women. It needs to contain a future vision. And a couple of people said to me, oh, I don't know that we can get there. Like, I don't know how to get there from here. And I'm not that optimistic. And and my answer to that was, that's okay. Like, we don't have to know. The first step is actually imagining that things can be different, right? And if we create that, that cultural imaginary, it gives us something to work for. And other people can fill in the blanks to sort of, oh, I have an idea of a piece of how we can get there from here. Um, and so, you know, I, I can talk on an interpersonal basis. The way to start is literally looking inside ourselves because women are not immune from the cultural disbelief of women. I write in my essay about how uh, girls in a 2015 study preferred male leaders. Um, you know, we just heard a week or two ago from Harvey Weinstein's lawyer uh, when asked whether she'd ever been sexually assaulted said that she hadn't because she'd never put herself in that position. Uh <laughs> Who no, says? really, li literally said that. Yeah, that's almost a direct quote. Um, <laughs> so women also grow up in this culture and, and contain that distrust. So whatever your gender is, it starts, it starts at home, right? It starts internally. And just start by noticing, right? Noticing also not just do you believe the women in your lives when they talk about what's going on for them and do you believe them in different ways 
than you do men. But also, how do you feel about women who are credible? Because one of the dynamics in our way is that when men, when we perceive them as more credible, they're, we also perceive them as more likable. We like men that we can trust, which makes sense. <laughs> That's very logical. When women's credit, perceived credibility goes up, their likability goes down uh, because we really resent women who make us like them, who make us believe them. Because because the culture is believed is built on not believing women, it creates a tension, an unpleasant feeling when women are credible, uh, and that we're shrill or we're a bunch of words I probably can't say on air. Um, but but you know the stereotype I'm talking about. I think we're seeing some of it play out in the Democratic primary, honestly. Um, so I think that it starts by noticing how we're each participating in that, because surely we are. And it's also, I am, I think, kind of difficult because so much of our perceptions and the language that we use to describe our experience are given by patriarchy. Yes. Oh, absolutely. So even being able to talk about experiences in a way that's credible sometimes is a little bit of a minefield, right? Um, given that, um, you know, even for women to acknowledge that um, their experience is something important themselves. Yeah. Well, and also the words we use mean different things. So when men say that they had bad sex, for example, they generally mean it wasn't that much fun, right? <laughs> it was kind of a letdown. When women say they had bad sex, they tend to mean it hurt. It either hurt physically, like they're having vaginismus or other issues that make the sex physically hurt, oh, and or it was actually sexual violence. It was not bad sex, it was violence. Um, and so the language, we're, we're also talking past each other, right? And so we, as women, have been taught to minimize, right? And we don't want to identify as victims because we know that victims aren't credible. Our victims are going to be undermined. And so we say something like, oh, I had bad, it was bad sex. And then I talk to those women years later who say, I'm only now admitting to myself that it was actually violence and if that worked, I'd be for it, right? If it actually protected women from feeling the trauma that comes along with that violence. But it doesn't. It only isolates women. It keeps us from seeking healing and seeking justice. And then that trauma is still there sort of festering and not attended to because we're not allowed to even say because it sounds so dramatic to say I was raped, right? It sounds like a thing you're almost not allowed to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How is it that we can get around the quote unquote likability problem or even framing things in that way, which is a way of, in some sense, deflecting actually believing women, right? Mm -hmm. How can we get around that? Because it seems like at least in, in politics, right? That is the go-to way of talking about women candidates, whether or not they're likable. Right. Or whether or not, as Chris Matthews once said, or maybe it was not him, but it feels like it was him. Um, like, oh, they Hillary reminds me of my ex-wife. Or, you know, like that, that when women are found credible and powerful, that it makes men uncomfortable and men, men and women sometimes find them unpleasant. I mean... Look, if I knew the actual answer for, to that, I'd be working for the Elizabeth Warren campaign. <laughs> um, I think that the that we at least can call it out every time we see it, right? Every time you see somebody going down that electability, likability, you know, it's it's just a set up narrative to keep women and people of color out of the process. Um, it it's really just code from like for you make me uncomfortable. There's something about you that makes me uncomfortable. And, and you know, in the workplace, there are ways around it. It's harder in the electrical sphere. But, for example, um, for symphony orchestras, 
it's now standard to have blind auditions where literally the musician auditions behind a screen and they don't know the gender or name or race or or identity of the person who's playing. And so they can evaluate them based on their musicianship before they let all that bias creep in. And so depending on what part of the culture we're in, there are ways to screen that out. It's, I don't know how to do that in a presidential election, but there are ways to screen for it um, in other places to sort of notice our biases I mean, I think one of the things we can do is all admit that, like, we're all biased. We all carry biases. We all grew up in some culture with some set of biases. And so it's not about, oh, I'm going to just be neutral. I think that one of the things that's hurting us is the myth that we can be neutral, right? Instead, we have to own our biases and think about how we can engineer around them to be fair, right? Yeah, and it also... from from what you're saying suggests that we need to learn to be uncomfortable. Yes, comfort with discomfort. Absolutely. Well, and I Because think- the status quo of course is about the comfort of the already powerful. Yeah, yes. exactly. The status quo <laughs> is always about the comfort of all the already powerful. A- 100% of the time. Yeah. And I think that we need to um get willing to sacrifice something right which has to which is a form of discomfort right Mm -hmm. that wanting these changes that would come if we could shift the culture to just treating women as credible and important has to we have to decide that it's worth it enough that we're willing to give other stuff up and for men that's some forms of cultural power Mm -hmm. right it Mm -hmm. just is Mm -hmm. i you know it's it's very fashionable these days to talk about the ways that patriarchy harms men and it does harm men in some ways. Those are legitimate conversations, but it's still on balance, better deal for them, most of them, or they would have rejected it. And so, you know, we need for men especially to say, yeah, this is going to cost me something and it's worth it. And what are the sort of things that we need to be willing to sacrifice in order to, a, put women more in the center of the conversation, right? Take them seriously and also take the, you know, consider what their experiences are important. What might we have to give up? I mean, uh, I think a lot about Congresswoman Ayanna Presley saying the people closest to the pain should be closest to the power. Right. And so literally some people need to give up some power. Mm-hmm. Right. Which is that's a big ask. Right. None of us give up us power. None of us give up power very easily. It's, it's hard. Um, most of us, regardless of how true this is, feel like other people have more power than us and we need whatever we have to keep ourselves safe. Um, well, let's talk about this because, you know, we're, I, I, I don't want to assume here, but, but let's just say amongst white women. You can assume that. Yes. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, we, we have to give up some power. Yeah, we absolutely have to give up some power. What does that look like what, in terms of making room for the voices of women of color? I mean, for me, it looks sometimes like turning down invitations to talk to the press invitations to participate in panels which are going to be all white um it looks like making an anthology instead of writing a book just full of my own ideas right one of the joys of making this anthology was getting to lift up the voices of many women including many women of color uh who i think are fantastic and you know in some ways that's a that's an ego exercise, right? Like, I have a lot of things to say about this, but I'm going to actually let lots of other people take over the pages of this book I'm producing. Um, so it can look a lot of different ways. It can also it can look it can look a lot like learning to shut up and listen. Right. That that you may think you have an opinion about something, but maybe your opinion is not the most important opinion here. So when Kobe Bryant died. I I tweeted something shortly thereafter and then kind of immediately regretted it and thought, I don't think this is my conversation, right? Like I 
have never been a sports fan. I am obviously not a woman of color. I, I just never had a relationship with Kobe as anything other than a guy who was accused of sexual assault, right? I knew about that case because I've been working in the sexual violence space for a long time. Um, and so I just wanted to make space for primarily for black women to talk about how they were feeling and support the complexity of it. You know, I'm never in favor of erasing the complexity and saying like that now that this man has died, everything that he ever did was good. Um, but I don't need to be in the forefront of that conversation. My opinion was not the most important opinion there. And, and so sometimes it's literally about like shutting up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also it sounds like making space for and inviting the people whose opinions in this situation are maybe closer to speak. Exactly. And, you know, retweeting them and amplifying them instead of inserting my own opinion. I'm sure I could have pitched a piece somewhere and, and published it, but I, there's no reason for me to occupy that space. There are so many women of color who were doing a fantastic job with a complex variety of perspectives, some of which I agreed with and some of which I didn't, but again, wasn't like ultimately about me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you suggest in the book is that if women, if, if men were held accountable for the, basically the the things that they are doing to women then that would be a step towards believing women and taking them seriously mm -hmm. and yet we find in general in the culture women uh, men are not held accountable what how could we change that i think we need to have a really deep conversation about what accountability is and what it can be and what it isn't, right? So there are a couple of essays that touch on this. Uh, one about the deeply flawed <laughs> criminal justice system and, and basically how it could be changed to be better for survivors and, sur and to center survivors more. And one about sort of stepping outside that system altogether and focusing more on transformative justice and healing. Uh, and I, I am always for there being lots of options for survivors and acknowledging that all of them are imperfect um, in, in different ways. So, but in addition, I think that there's so much conversation now since the sort of Me Too narrative burst on the scene about like, well, how long until we forgive this guy, right? Like, Hasn't it been long? Like, when do we get to redeem this guy? And and most of those narratives skip entirely over the fact that that man has not sought redemption, right? He maybe, maybe has issued a very wan, like, I'm sorry if people were hurt, a kind of apology. But an apology is not a seeking of redemption by itself either. Uh, you know, there's been no evidence of a making of amends there's no evidence of him working on himself to figure out what it was inside him that made it able to do that stuff and what has changed now so that he feels confident he won't do it again right there, there's no there there are steps to redemption right there are and and as a culture we seem to want to skip them right that if this guy like sits alone with his piles of money for long enough, like six months, a year, I don't know, you know, whoever it is and who, whatever he's done. I mean, Harvey Weinstein last fall was like a, going to like New York actor showcases. Have you not heard about this? No. There was a, a comedy night hosted to benefit like a New York acting organization sort of that supports young actors. And he was invited and he had evidently gone once before and these three people, two women, one non-binary person, all confronted him in different ways. One of them was a performer and she confronted him from the stage that night, which is so brave. Uh, one of them like called out the audience for enabling him and the other like basically yelled to his face, which I think must have been very satisfying. Uh, but they were kicked out of the venue, not him. 
Oh, wow. Right. And this is in the end of 2019. So there we are, right? There we are, not believing women and not changing the structures that support right. not believing. Well, and that's Harvey Weinstein, who is the sort of example against every which every other guy is forgiven, right? I, I would love to have a count of the number of times someone has said to me, well, sure, but it's not like he's Harvey Weinstein, right? As a way of arguing that whatever guy has been caught mistreating women in whatever way, like, well, we're overreacting because he's not a Harvey Weinstein. But this was literally Harvey Weinstein. Uh, and he's still, you know, the most of the people in that room were defending him. The The folks who confronted him were the ones who were made to leave. We have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. And we need to understand that time out of the spotlight or like losing your incredibly powerful job is not the same thing as actual accountability. What do you hope that readers will take away from the book? I hope that they'll get excited by one or more of the visions in the book and feel motivated to work toward it right? That they'll really connect with one or more of those ideas and think, oh, wow, like, that's the that's the world I want to live in, and and start helping us think about how to get from here to there. Um, I hope that men who read it are a little uncomfortable. Not that, you know, like, I, I think it's a great book for men to read. Like, I really hope men will read it. But I hope that it, it prompts them to do some internal soul, soul searching. And I think, I'd like for women and non-binary folks to have that reaction as well. I think I'd like for women who read it to feel a little less crazy, right? Like, oh, oh, I see how all these systems are working. It's not just me. Um, but mostly I hope people feel like there's hope, like there's something to work toward. I have been talking today to writer, speaker, and activist Jacqueline Friedman, who is the co-author, along with Jessica Valenti, of Believe Me, How Trusting Women Can Change the World. I am Suzanne Legrand, and this is Disobedient Femmes. <laughs> <laughs>